Love it. Fantastic. We are live. Yay. And Kaylin is juggling for us. Kia ora, Tato. Welcome back to another Q&A here at Digital Boost. I'm Georgia Hatches, and today I have the pleasure of hosting Kaylin Huntress today from Stellar Platforms. I'm really excited to introduce you to Kaylin and to have Kaylin share his mahi with you about marketing yourself. And really, we were talking earlier, Kaylin and I were on for a bit before and we were chit-chatting, and we were talking about how this is specifically for people who your business is your personal brand. Um, Kaylin, I will let you talk more about yourself. We, we've discovered some fun things about each other. We have a lot of things in common. Um, you know, obviously, well, you'll, it'll be obvious once Kaylin starts speaking, the American part is, is the Americans in New Zealand <laughs> is part of that. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hold that against us. Don't hold that <laughs> against us. We have wisdom to share. Uh, but Kaylin, I am so pleased that you reached out to us and are ready to share your marketing knowledge with us. I know everyone here, whether you are, you know, whether this is just your individual brand or whether your branding and your business is expansive, you will get something out of this. So I'm going to let you take this away. Oh, and before, sorry, housekeeping stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself. Any questions that you have? pop them into the Q&A for me or on your Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube. You can ask any questions in the comments. Um, I will be fielding those for Kaylin. And uh, yeah, so join our conversation. We're really happy to have you here. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, yeah. thanks, Georgia. Thanks for inviting me to, to um, speak with your community. And hi, everyone from Digital Boost across New Zealand. Um, as Georgia mentioned, I'm an American immigrant to New Zealand. Um, which means I'm descended from generations of immigrants who've left their homelands to seek better fortune across the sea. Uh, today, I'm broadcasting to you from Oamaru on the South Island, and I'd like to acknowledge the hereditary keepers of this land, Aotearoa, Te Wai Punamu, and also to acknowledge our digital ancestors who built this virtual landscape, this metaverse that allows us to congregate across time and space. So thank you to those who came before us, and may we do good works together here today. Now, um, I'm really interested in the personal brand. I've spent a lot of my time uh, as a digital nomad traveling across the world with my young family, uh, running a digital marketing agency called Stellar Platforms, where I help experts and entrepreneurs set up smart marketing systems. And after a decade of this, I wrote a book called Marketing Yourself. And this is gonna be the foundation of what we're gonna talk about today. How to market yourself as a personal brand. The advantages, the disadvantages, the difficulties, and the, the pitfalls that you may face and how to handle the challenges along the way. And in order to examine this very unique concept of how to market yourself, we're gonna look at the four cornerstones of your personal platform. But before we get into that, I want to know, what is the hardest thing about marketing yourself? Open up the chat box and go ahead and type your answer to this question. What is the hardest thing about marketing yourself? I'm going to, I'm going to set a timer for 30 seconds and just write your answer to this question. Ravi, you've got your hand raised. I think there might be confusion as to that. Yeah, you probably can't pop into your chat box, but you can go into the uh -huh. Q and A. Into the Q and A. Yeah. So marketing grief. Lee is Lee is like marketing grief. Mm -hmm. uh, Maddie says uh, chat disabled. So put it here. That's right. Put it in the Q and A. Uh, Ravi clicked by mistake. <laughs> Zip. Great. Now the answers are coming in. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. You've seen credibility. Yeah, these are these are all challenges that we face in marketing yourself. 
Well, I'm going to go over a quick agenda of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll, I'll share with you some of the, the insights that I've learned for, you know, the next 40 minutes or so. Feel free to interrupt me with questions or put a question in the Q&A box to put a pin in it for later. The last 15 minutes is just going to be Q&A. So you can save your questions till the end or feel free to add them at any time as we go through. And this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how to handle imposter syndrome and battle self-censorship, how to craft a compelling personal statement that helps you stand out from the crowd, and then finally, how to elevate your personal platform by building on the four cornerstones. Now, for everybody who stays to the end of this workshop, I'm going to give you a free digital copy of my book. And if you're watching this on the replay or the live stream, then you just have to go and hunt down Digital Boost. We're gonna, we'll, we'll add the, the links into the comments of the live stream and of the, uh, of the posts at the end of the session. Um, but if you're look, watching this on the replay on Digital Boost's website, there should be a button somewhere nearby that has this book. Uh, this is the book that Derek Sivers called the most actionable marketing book he's ever seen with great step-by-step -step instructions with memorable examples. Uh, David Newman, the chairman of the Million Dollar Speakers Group, said there are books that you read and books that you use, and that this is the second kind. Consider this your action guide, implementation kit, and field manual for marketing success, and that there are page and after page of money-making ideas that work and last. And Jackie Berry says this book gives you an actionable process so your audience can see you, hear you, and find you. Now, everything that I just shared about my book, does that make me a tall poppy? Am I just inflating my sense of self-worth by trying to stand up and elevate myself higher than the crowd? That's part of what it means to market yourself. You have to be willing to stand out and shine. Every time you put an artificial ceiling above yourself because you don't want to become that tall poppy, you're deflating the impact of your marketing. As an American, I, I don't feel tall poppy syndrome that much. It's, uh, and I have this theory about how tall poppies um, only get cut down in places where the ground is even like in New Zealand or in Costa Rica, where I lived for a while. There's this, there's this equality that's a virtue, but it means that you have to deal with tall poppy syndrome. In Costa Rica, they called it crabs in a bucket because you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, it's the other crabs who pull them back down. But in America, the ground is so uneven that it's only those who stand out tallest that can survive. So some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you today, I know it's going to go run counter to the cultural mores that you have inherited from your culture. But I want to challenge you to re-examine those cultural mores. Because to market yourself, standing out is what you need to do. Now, when you do this, you inevitably face imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is something that everybody who has a personal brand has to deal with. And, and I'll give you some examples. You might have heard of this, uh, this writer by the name of John Steinbeck, guy who wrote the great American novel. He said, I'm not a writer. I've been fooling myself and other people. Maya Angelou, who won three Emmys after her 11th book said, each time I write a book, I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. Albert Einstein said, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease, and I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. So if you feel imposter syndrome, I want you to know you're in good company. Imposter syndrome is a natural consequence of growth. There's this distance between who you are and who you want to be 
And you need to embody that higher version of yourself, even though you know who you used to be. In dealing with imposter syndrome, I, I love the advice of David Carr. He said, I now inhabit a, a life I don't deserve, but we all walk this earth feeling we are frauds. The trick is to be grateful and hope the caper doesn't end too soon. Marketing at its core is a series of failed experiments. You try something and it doesn't work and you use the knowledge that you've gained to try something new. But if you only do what works and what's proven to work, you're never gonna do anything groundbreaking or unexpected. And in marketing, that's what gets attention. The unexpected, the surprising. And in order to elevate yourself, you have to fake it till you make it. This guy is never gonna do a push up unless he gets in position, lays down on the ground, puts his hands down there, and tries to do a push up before he's ready. Some of the things I'm gonna share with you today, you might have that same reaction. I'm not ready. I can't do this. But I want you to remember that true progress is only earned by the fakers. The ones who are willing to pretend that they have achieved what they want to achieve. If you're willing to get up on a platform and share your message and shine your light, you're going to attract haters. There's gonna be people who will chuck rocks at you because you're visible, because they have some internal trauma about somebody like you. And they're gonna to wanna to take out their trauma on you for daring to shine brightly. Are you willing to do that? Because if you are, you can create a business and a lifestyle that suits you best, but you have to be willing to be seen. Being seen, to what uh, one of you said here in the, Maddie, you said this in the, in the Q&A box, that being seen is the most challenging thing about marketing yourself. Unfortunately, this is, this is what you have to work on, is this comfort with visibility. And it gets more comfortable to be visible when you have a solid platform. Now, there's a lot of different ways that people use this word platform. And when I use the word platform, I use it in a very specific way. I mean somebody who has something to say and something to sell. If you have something to say and something to sell, you have a platform. And people who have a personal platform, they generally face the same four problems. Uh, they, they go through the same four levels of a platform. And the first level is a soapbox. And anyone who has something to say can get up on their soapbox and say it. But it's not until you have something to sell that it becomes a commercial enterprise. That's why the second level of platform is the showroom. And at the showroom level, your communication is focused on the things you have on offer and how people can buy from you. And a showroom is great because you can support a business from a showroom. But the problem with a showroom is it has a ceiling. You can only fit so many people inside of a showroom. And so eventually people grow to the third level of a platform, which is the stage. And at the stage level, you've exhausted your existing audience and you have to go find other audiences to share your message with and shine your light and your systems do the selling for you. The fourth level of platform is the stadium. 
And at the stadium level, your moves move the market. People look to you for the industry standard. Stadiums are exhilarating because you can see so far, but they're also dangerous because it's much farther to fall. So at a stadium level, it's more important to decide what not to do than to decide what you will do. So I want to know, what level are you at right now? Open the Q&A box and type one of these four words. Are you at the soapbox? Just figuring out what you say. Type the word soapbox. If you're at the showroom, type showroom. If you're at the stage or the stadium, type that in the Q&A box. And if you're watching this on the live stream or on the replay, just go ahead and type it as a comment. Let me know where you are right now. Now, I've worked with people at all four of these levels, and they all have different challenges and different advantages. But I find to elevate the platform through these levels, they rely on the same four cornerstones. There's what you say and what you sell, and that's your positioning and your profit. Those are the external cornerstones. Those are the ones that people can see when they're looking at you. But there's these two cornerstones at the back that are just as important. And those are your strategy and your systems. We could call these cornerstones on the left your visionary cornerstones and those on the right your practical cornerstones. And if any one of these cornerstones is weak or is lower than the others, then your platform's always going to be leaning in that direction. That one cornerstone is always going to be dominating your attention. And so I want to know which one of these cornerstones gives you the most grief. Type it in the Q&A box or put it in the, in the comment on this post. Which one of these cornerstones are you always struggling with? The one you're always trying to deal with because it keeps messing things up. And this is unique to each of us, you know? I'm seeing some systems, some positioning, some profit. Yep. Yep, the challenge that you face is going to be unique to you. But if you want to elevate your platform, what I often recommend to my clients is to focus on the weakest cornerstone first. To bring that one up to the same level as the rest. And then to get from one level to the next, you just stack the cornerstones. You could spend three months working on one cornerstone and three months on another, and you can go through all four in turn. And I've seen people take three years to go up this entire ladder. It's fast to do it that way, but it can be done. It just takes intention and strategy. Now, I'm going to share with you some things that I've learned about each one of these cornerstones. And I'm going to start with what you say. Your positioning as a personal brand is different than businesses. My business, Stellar Platforms, it's got its own type of positioning. But people don't trust business brands the way they trust personal brands. Dr. Alan Weiss says there is no brand as powerful as your own name. Now, I could have quoted his business I think it's something like uh, super consultants or something. I can't remember what his business is, but I remember his personal name because I remember the person. And with a personal brand, a personal brand is such a weird concept, right? Because a brand, it originally started as something you would sear into the side of a head of livestock. A brand denoted ownership. And it said, this head of cattle belongs to me. That's what a brand was. And over time, a brand has evolved to mean a, an umbrella 
of products and services that are delivered by an individual or organization. That's what a brand is. Coca-Cola is a brand. Um, uh, IRD is a brand. You, you have something in mind when you think of those things. And your personal name is also a brand. In his book, The Brand Gap, author Marty Neumeyer says, your brand should answer three questions. Who are you? What do you do? And why does it matter? If your brand can answer these three questions, you have good positioning. You have a powerful personal brand. And what most people do is they, they recommend that you should package this brand into an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is, uh, you know, something, it's a paragraph that you memorize that you can, um, you can talk at someone with while you're sharing an elevator with someone and they can't get away. You know, and I find this useful because it makes you collect everything that matters into a tidy little paragraph. But I find this also flawed because an elevator pitch, you know, a couple of paragraphs gives you a lot of room to go off onto tangents. And so I prefer the personal statement, something that you could fit on a sticky note. It's so short, so distilled, that you can't get lost in it. I'll share with you the best personal statement I ever heard. It was from a guy named Corey Huff. And I met Corey at, uh, at Pioneer Nation in 2015, which was a conference for location independent entrepreneurs. And everybody there was running a business from their laptop and they were all doing interesting, unique things. And I met Corey and shook his hand and I said, what do you do? And he said, I help artists sell their work online. That is a personal statement that is sticky, clear, and short. Instantly, I knew everyone who I could refer to Corey's website at theabundantartist.com. Every artist I knew who was trying to sell their work online, I said, hey, there's somebody I know that you should talk with. His personal statement became a magnet so that the right kinds of clients came to find him. His personal statement worked so well because it was easy to remember, easy to understand, and easy to endure. I didn't have to interrupt him or ask clarifying questions. It was hard to forget, hard to complicate, and hard to interrupt. So I'll give you a formula you can use for your own personal statement. I help these people dealing with this problem by this solution. And so what I'd like you to do now, I'm going to go ahead and set a timer for 30 seconds. And I'd like you to make a personal statement using this formula. You can write it in the Q&A box or in the comment of this post if you want to share it, or you could just do it on your own. So take 30 seconds and write out a personal statement using this formula. <laughs> So by now, you should have a personal statement that's sticky, clear, and short. Now, I, I go through a lot of the, um, the, the types of, uh, of personal statements that matter in some of the case studies on my website. It's over there in the corner, uh, at Kaylin Huntress. You can find me online every, anywhere. Uh, and I want to close out this cornerstone about positioning by reminding you of the advice of Joss Whedon. He said, always be yourself unless you suck. And this is actually really useful advice, right? Because if you suck, you can just pretend to be somebody else. We're all very unique. 
We have a lot of very interesting things about ourselves, but you don't need to share all of that online. There's a lot about myself that I keep private, even though I have a very public persona. Because there's parts about me that you would think really suck. So you have to be cautious about what you share and what you keep private. This public-private balance, it's delicate. Some people think that sharing all of the um, nasty stuff about yourself leads to authenticity, this whole Brene Brown power of vulnerability movement. Um, but many people have found that when they tried doing that, it's, um, it can really damage your reputation and your relationships. So I wanna urge you to be cautious and intentional about what you share. Now, ne le next, let's talk about the profit cornerstone, what you sell. And I, <laughs> I, I got some really great advice for you from um, internet marketer, Derek Halpern. He says, build an audience and sell them what they want. That's how you make profit online. Now, doesn't this guy look like an internet marketer? You know, I've, I, I like following people like this because they don't get caught up in, um, you know, in the fluff. They focus on what works, what actually makes an impact. And marketing is experiments. The things that worked 10 years ago, they might not work today. And you won't find that out unless you do the experiment yourself. And a lot of this experimentation happens in the marketplace where customers are trying to balance the risk versus the reward. How risky is this purchase versus how much reward will I get? Will I save time? Will I save money? Will I save headaches? If it's enough, then it might be worth the risk. When you have a personal brand, it's, it's your own reputation that's on the line. And so that's why your own personal integrity really matters. But there's this continuum that people go through from stranger to customer. And you can't sell to strangers the same way that you can sell to customers. That's why it's useful to have a, a value ladder. And a value ladder gives your customer options based on how much risk they feel comfortable taking in hiring you. If they really trust you and they think that you're great, they might be willing to spend thousands of dollars. But if they don't know you at all, it's a really hard sell. But it's much easier to convince a, tr a stranger to take one small step up the value ladder. And this is an example of, of the value ladders that I've seen with thousands of different uh, experts and entrepreneurs is that you, you've got free content and some of that's for the public, meaning anybody can read it or watch it or see it. And that's what you post on social media, what, uh, what you have on your website, any stranger can consume your public free content. But then there's private free content that they have to subscribe to get. Maybe they subscribe to your newsletter or create an account on your website, as with Digital Boost, you get access to some great free private content if you set up an account on their website. And then there's the Tripwire. And the Tripwire is a small, low-priced item to separate your buyers from your tire kickers. It's basically to see who's going to pull out their credit card and be willing to pay you for a few dollars. And then you've got low priced, mid priced and high priced offers. Down at the bottom, there's free samples. You know, that's uh, if you go into a grocery store uh, and you're walking through the aisles, you might see somebody with a little table and they say, hey, do you want to try a bite of this guacamole dip? That's like a free sample. They're, they're not asking you to invest in the avocado farm or to put 12 pounds of avocados in your in the boot of your car. They're, they're offering a free sample something really small and then the, the and then we go up through this value ladder sorry if you can hear my dogs barking in the background they're they're, they're loud and enthusiastic um this tripwire it trips a lot of people up 
And so I'll, I'll refer you to Ryan Dice, the founder of digitalmarketer.com. He says, according to my research, if somebody takes a $7 tripwire offer, they're 10 times more likely to buy the main product. Which means you can market to those people differently, more aggressively than to your general email list. That's why a tripwire is so powerful is because it segments your buyers out. People who you can give more sales messages to and not exhaust the relationship. So here's a value ladder from uh, Tony Robbins, the alpha male of personal development. He's, I, I'm sure you've heard of Tony Robbins. He's, uh, he's got a podcast and it's free and anybody can listen to it. You can go to wherever you listen to podcasts and listen to Tony Robbins podcast and he'll share with you some valuable information. And he also got a newsletter and his newsletter gets you access to his business mastery e-course. It's only for subscribers. You got to fill out your name and your email address. And then he sends you this, uh, this uh, free e-course. And one of the, uh, the principles in that e-course is keeping track of your activity and planning out your activity and his RPM monthly calendar available for 1295 is a really great way to monitor that, ac that activity. After buying that monthly calendar, that tripwire product, you're dropped into an automation sequence that upsells his $300 personal power 30 day course. That upsell is seen a lot more frequently by the people who purchased the tripwire than the people who just subscribed to the eMastery course. And he doesn't even mention it on the podcast. After taking the 30 day course, you're invited to his, uh, his signature event, unleash the power within it's his, it's his live event. He's got, you know, it's, it's five days. It's full of, uh, all this great material, people standing on their chairs and hooting and hollering. And the last day of that event is pretty much just a pitch for his high priced offer, the $10,000 mastery university conference. What Tony Robbins does here. That's so smart is he sells one step above. He doesn't crow about his master university conference on his podcast. He does that to people one step below because it's a lot easier to ask somebody to take one more step up than it is to ask them to go all the way to the top. Now, what, what I focus on a lot with my digital marketing agency is helping people set up the automation systems that enable them to go out onto, onto stages and, and share their message. And they typically handle that conversion from free public, where people are watching them on stage, to free private, where they subscribe to the newsletter. That transition is handled with a lead magnet. And a lead magnet is often a, a PDF or an email course that's automated. So you don't have to do any work when somebody subscribes. And the lead magnet is really great for converting your public audience into a private audience, but it has to solve a very specific kind of problem. The lead magnet solves a problem that requires high expertise and low difficulty. For problems that don't require very much expertise and they're not that difficult, you can do it yourself. If it is very difficult, but still ha requires low expertise, you can hire somebody cheap to do it. In the, the world of digital nomads, you know, you, you hire somebody in the Philippines for five bucks an hour and they can handle those high difficulty, low expertise challenges. For problems that are both very difficult and require high expertise, that's what people hire you for with your services or they buy your premium products. But for the lead magnet, this is something specific that requires low difficulty and high expertise. And if you can share with somebody, here's how you do it. And here's one of my lead magnets is, is a call to action workbook. You need a lot of copywriting expertise to write a good call to action. That closing line at the bottom of your email or the headline of your Facebook ad. It's the most distilled, compact, profitable sentence you can write is the call to action. 
And being able to do it, it's not that difficult when you have formulas, but it does require high expertise. And so that's why I offer this as a lead magnet for people to subscribe to my list. Because they need that high expertise, but they're willing to do a piece of it themselves. And so that's what I want you to think about with lead magnets, is what could somebody do themselves if they had my expertise? So now we're gonna move on to the third cornerstone, which is what you decide to do, your strategy. And with strategy, you know, it, there's, we need to make a distinction here first between marketing and sales, because people think these overlap, but they really don't. In these three concentric circles, this center circle is your customers, the people who have paid you, so you give them service. Sales is much closer to customers than marketing is. There's this boundary line for somebody to go from sales into service, and that's the financial transaction where they pay you, right? There's a difference between somebody you're selling to and a customer that you're serving, and the difference is they've paid you money. There's a similar distinction between marketing and sales. There's an action that your customer needs to take And it's the difference between pulling them to you and pushing them to make a decision. Selling yourself is only, oh, look at this, I'm in the way. Sorry about my layout here. Selling yourself is only pushy if you haven't been pulling. This boundary between sales and marketing, between pulling and pushing, this is a voluntary action on the part of your customer. They need to raise their hand and say, I want to know more about how to do business with you. Until they do that, you're just attracting them. You're not convincing them to do anything. You're pulling them in. And I'll give you an example with a, with a retail store. You know, you, you can see a retail store on the outside, and you could see a retail store on the inside. And on the outside, that's when you're pulling. And on the inside, that's when you're pushing. If you were looking in through the window of a store and the, the clerk came out and said, hey, would you like to buy something in there? That would be pushy. But when you cross the threshold, you go into the store, you pick an item up off the rack and you're looking at the price tag, it's totally legit for that person to say, would you like to buy that? Because you've made the voluntary action to enter the store, select something to look at, and you're in a moment of consideration. That's when it's time to push. It's not time to push when you're marketing. When you're marketing, that's when you're sending out your newsletter. You're writing articles. You're sending brochures, you're making videos. That's different than sales. Sales is when you're making phone calls, you're submitting proposals, you're writing contracts, you're sending personal emails. These two audiences, marketing versus sales, are different and you should treat them differently. And there's a concept that I wanna share with you here that I think will be useful. I'm just gonna launch a whiteboard because I think that it would be useful to, to learn about this. It's, it's something that, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people have challenges with um, emails. They don't wanna be so pushy with emails. And so that's why I recommend that you send a spear email. Uh-oh, Zoom has updated again and I can't find, sorry, one moment. I can't find my bar. Oh, because I'm not an owner of this organization. Okay, so never mind. I cannot. I cannot use the whiteboard. Sorry about that. I'll just express it to you verbally. The emails that you want to send for sales as opposed to marketing should be SPEAR emails. And SPEAR is an acronym. SPEAR stands for short, personal, expecting a reply. 
A lot of times when we do sales emails, we want to, we feel like, oh, we need to put everything in here. We need to qualify. We need to build the relationship. We need to do testimonials and we need to, to make sure we're not pushing too hard. And then you create this big bloated email. But the most successful sales emails, in my experience, are short, personal, and expecting a reply. One of my spear emails is, uh, do you want to talk with me about your digital marketing? Hey, I saw your newsletter go out. Did you get a lot of uh, traction on that? If not, I think I can help you increase your sales. Do you want to talk about it? Short, personal, expecting a reply. When you send these emails, you want to focus on what makes you unique. This is part of your strategy, is leveraging the things that help you stand out from the crowd. But what makes you unique can, um, you know, we, we, especially in cultures with tall poppy syndrome, you know, we're told don't fly too high. And, uh, you know, Seth Godin wrote this great book called The Icarus Deception, where he talks about how we take the wrong lesson from the Icarus myth. And Icarus and his father Daedalus, who built the labyrinth on the island of Crete, they escaped by building these wings made of wax and feathers. And, uh, and, uh, and as we all know, Icarus flew too high, the wax melted his wings, and he fell to his doom. And his father gave him two pieces of advice before they set out. He said, don't fly too high, or the sun will melt your wings. But he also said, don't fly too low, because the spray from the ocean will make your wings wet and you'll plummet to your doom. So when you look at your strategy, when you look at your personal brand, I wanna remind you of what Michelangelo said. He said, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. So I want you to aim high. Now let's talk about systems. Now, a lot of people I work with, they hate systems, which is why they hire me, because they, they want to be up on stage delivering their keynotes, they want to be writing their books, uh, and so they partner with people like me who can do all the systems behind the scenes. Um, you know, some people look at, a, look at something like this and they're like, their eyes glaze over, you know, but I, I think that this is really interesting strategic work is how do we set up the systems? For social media, you can say, I'm gonna post once on Instagram and then syndicate those posts across all the other platforms. Or you can say, I'm just gonna focus on these platforms and post uniquely on each one. You get to systematize in the way that best supports your strategy. But you wanna be careful that your systems don't decrease your authenticity. I'm a lifelong sender of handwritten notes. You know, I, I, especially sending them from New Zealand to my clients in Portugal and in Perth. They, they're really excited when they get an international handwritten card. It makes a really big impact. But you can automate that. And my Twitter friend, Pete Laya, he said he, he got an automated note that was masquerading as authentic. And it made him so upset, he went to Twitter to talk about how much it hurt the relationship. So when we talk about systems, I wanna caution you not to automate out the authenticity. Use the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your content should be automated and 20% should be authentic. However, you should spend 80% of your time on that authentic content and 20% of your time on the automated content. Setting up systems can be really daunting for some people, but we have so many automation capabilities at our disposal that you can be really intentional about how you set it up, how you launch it, and how you maintain it. This is a, um, a, a webinar funnel that I typically use when I'm working with uh, somebody who says, hey, I've got a, I've got a webinar and I want to sell this course. I, I say, great, let's start with this. And then I, and I use all the templates for the landing pages and the, the emails to set it up so that all I need is the basic idea from the client and I can populate all these pieces. And one of the reasons I can do it so fast 
is because of ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT has dramatically changed the marketing landscape. It is not the same as it was three years ago. But I want to remind you that as copywriter Brooklyn Nash says, AI gets the job done like instant coffee gets the job done. There's a time and a place for instant coffee. You know, instant coffee can be really handy, but you should, you don't want to drink it every day. So when you're using ChatGPT, the big mistake I see people make is they think that ChatGPT is their one smart assistant who can do everything for them, but that's not what it does. It's actually more like infinite dumb assistants. So when you're trying to use ChatGPT, think of them like these minions. That they can go and do all these dumb, clearly defined things, but they can't do higher level thinking. The purpose of all these automation tools is we want to bring people through the four step marketing cycle. Of know, like, trust and buy. People need to know you before they like you. They need to like you before they trust you and they have to trust you before they buy from you. If you skip any one of these steps, you will not make it to the end. This is a way to measure the journey from stranger into customer. Each one of the four steps on the marketing cycle, it's a transition point. When they know you, it's because they've started browsing your content. When they like you, it's because they've started following you. When they trust you, it's because they subscribed to your newsletter. That's an act of trust. I'm going to give you my contact information and trust that you won't spam me. And when they buy from you, that's when they become a customer. And there's lots of ways that you can measure these metrics. You know, as a digital marketer, I do a lot of these online. You know, I measure the traffic on the website, the open rates on the newsletters, the conversion rates of the products. Because as Jim Rohn told us, what gets measured gets managed. If you're not measuring your marketing, you can't manage your marketing. So I've got a lot of tools that I've developed over the, over the, uh, the years to help people elevate their personal platform, because what I really want to see is I want to see people as a larger than larger version of themselves. When you upgrade yourself, you step into this different version of yourself. It might not feel like it fits. It's always uncomfortable when you stand out. When you shine. But if you're willing to do that, you can attract the right kinds of people to you and make their lives better through your work. When you withhold yourself, you're doing a disservice to your community. And so I wanna encourage you to get up on your platform, share your message and shine your light because that's how you're gonna make the world a better place. Now, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat box with my book, Marketing Yourself. You can read this as a, a PDF or an EPUB, depending on how you like it. Uh, and there's also a link here for um, a survey. And this survey will give you, um, you can take the survey anonymously if you like, uh, or you can, uh, if, if you want to subscribe to my email newsletter and stay in touch, that's a great way to do it. Um, and I'm happy to give you the slides as long as you give me some feedback on how I did. I'm a professional keynote speaker for virtual events, and uh, your feedback helps me give better pre presentations in the future. So um, I appreciate the time you spent with me today. And now I'd like to open, up, uh, open the floor up to questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and open up the Q&A box. Or if you're on the live stream, go ahead and write it in the comment, and, uh, and I'll just answer your questions for the next 10 minutes. Well, oh, thanks, Kaylin. Yeah, I am going to, for those of you who are here on the Zoom, you can see in the chat. I know the chat box is disabled. I'm just curious if you can actually see it when we post things in. So if mm. you can, let me know. Um, and if not, that's good information. But also, I will take these links and put them into the live stream comments as well so that they'll be available. Thank you, Kaylin, for passing on your book to us. And let's see what we've got. I can see the links in the chat. We can see it. Thank you. Thank you for Great. verifying that for me. Um, 
You know, it's, it's some people are better at technology than most. And I'm going to say, I am not one of those people. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Like the rest of you trying to learn the best, the most that I can out of digital boost. Um, so any questions we are going to be here and we're opening up the floor to any of you. And I'll just take a look around, um, our, our live stream sites, but I just also wanted to say, Kaylin, that was really informative. I, I, I love the idea of these four platforms and and how when you find that you have that weakness in one or where you're feeling like this one is real struggle for me, this is a real challenge to focus on that and go, all right, let's, it, it sort of gives you a framework of where to begin. And, mm -hmm. you know, looking at what some of our, I, mean, I just wanted to see what some of our people had said in the beginning, what they were looking for, what they were needing is, you know, that being seen, the challenges they were having in their marketing, right? And marketing themselves, being seen, um, credibility, right? Like how, how do you feel that imposter syndrome that you talked about, I think goes along with all of this, you mm -hmm. know, how do you even get started, yeah. um, separating yeah, your I, private life from professional mm -hmm. life? Yeah. You know? Thank you, Heidi, for sharing that. I mean, that, that's something that a lot of people struggle with is how much of myself do I share? And how much do I withhold? And I, I was I was struggling with this a while ago. And I asked one of my teachers, um, who's a well known famous speaker in Australia, uh, has been for decades. And I was and I was like, how do you know what to share and what to withhold? And he thought about it for a second. And he said, is it in service to the room? If it's in service to the room, then share it. But if it's not in service to the room, if it's only in service to yourself, then keep it private. And I find that to be a, a very useful heuristic on do I share this or not? Great, Steph, I see you've you've posted. I like when we follow you on LinkedIn, you have an automated newsletter subscription set up. I'll definitely be doing that now also. Yeah, LinkedIn newsletters are great. You do have to have creator mode turned on, but I typically use um, LinkedIn newsletters as a syndication. It's actually the same newsletter that I send out to my list but a week later. So if you're already sending out a newsletter anyway, the, what I recommend you do is after that newsletter has been sent out to your list, you know, give it a pause of a couple days to a week so that your subscribers are getting something, um, you know, uh, private for that for they get the, the first issue. But then after that, you can publish that same newsletter as an article on your blog as a newsletter on LinkedIn, as an article on medium.com, there's a lot of other places you can syndicate that same content to expand your reach. We do have a couple of other questions here for you. Um, how to market a product you think people need, but they don't know it? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is, this is a, a very interesting question for two reasons. And the first is, are you sure they don't, or are you sure that they need it? A lot of entrepreneurs, we create products that scratch our own itch, but I know from experience that the itches that I scratch are not the same itches that everybody else scratches. And so the first thing I would, I would do is I would find out, I would do some market, re market research to find out, do people really need this problem solved? But the second question this, this brings up is how to educate them that they need it. And there's a, the, the fields that I can think of that do this really well are uh, life insurance. So one of those things that you need, but you don't know that you need, or you don't want to think about it. And so the way that life insurance markets itself is they, they package with other things that you do know you need, like car insurance and renter's insurance. And then they add on, do you know you need life insurance too? They're often all together. Um, but then they, they come at the problem through um, a focus on family and dependence. What's going to happen to your family if something unexpected happens to you? Have you set things up? When you ask that question, it makes people realize, I need to do something about that. And so that's what I would recommend you do is, is these two things is first talk to the market, interview 10 potential uh, target customers and ask them about the problem. Don't sell them anything, make it clear, I'm not here to sell you anything. I wanna discover if you're facing these problems that I think you're facing. That way they'll be more open to open up. And the second thing is to find those questions that make them think about the problem. When you find that question, it, can, it, it serves as an entry point into a selling conversation. 
You know, I noticed you have an email newsletter. Are you selling your services through the newsletter? Or are you just sending out articles? That's an example of the kind of question I would ask to get people thinking about a problem they don't know they have. That's great. And then um, we've got another question here that says, thank you both for putting this on. You're welcome. Uh, just wondering if Kalen has any recommendations or experience with social media platform management tools. Do you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've, I've been around the social media block for quite a while. And um, there was a time when social media management tools were very effective, but then they got diluted because so many people were using them. Um, Hootsuite and TweetDeck and uh, Buffer are, you know, are examples of tools that can post to multiple platforms in advance. Uh, there's a really neat one called Hype Fury, which is, uh, which has some AI automation tools. Um, and so you could use any of those, but I'll share with you what I've found over the last few years is that social media platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, they know if you're using those tools. And they do not show your posts in the algorithm nearly as often if you're using those tools. So what I've been doing for the last couple of years is posting natively to each account. Most accounts, most platforms will let you publish, uh, schedule a post in advance. But if I have something that I wanna post on Instagram and on LinkedIn and on Twitter, I don't use buffer for it because it gets deprecated. Instead, I say I'm going to post it Wednesday on Instagram, Friday on LinkedIn, and next week on Twitter. And I'll go and I'll schedule those posts individually because I know it increases the likelihood that they'll get seen. That's really good information. Thank you. Yeah, well, and this, this gets to one final point I want to make, which is that information on the internet goes stale. The things that worked five years ago, you know, I, I wrote articles uh, 10 years ago about how to do stuff with social media that have very good SEO. And if you search for some of those topics, my old posts will be right up there at the top when you're searching on Google. But the tactics have changed. So even though because of the SEO mechanics, this has a lot of domain age, this is probably valid information, it's going to make it show at the top of the search results. But I want you to be skeptical of the marketing advice you read online, because the advice goes stale over time. What worked well five years ago doesn't necessarily work well today. That's really interesting, especially the point about the SEO where you can still pull it up but it's just mm -hmm. not current information anymore. Yeah. yeah. So Kayleen is saying, I post individually too, but it is very time consuming. Any tips and tricks? Yeah. Get a VA. Get a what? Uh, get a virtual a assistant. A virtual assistant. If you, I, I mentioned um, uh, virtual assistants in the Philippines earlier, um, but seriously, they are great because what I like to do is uh, I'll fire up a Loom video um, you've probably seen Loom. It's where you can record your screen and get your, um, you know, your, your headshot in the, in the corner. And then I'll open up a Trello card and make a checklist of what it is I'm doing. And I'm saying, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go over to LinkedIn and do this thing, and I'll demonstrate it on screen and then make the checklist as I go. Put that Loom on the Trello card, hand it over to an assistant, and they have a step-by-step -step standard operating procedure for doing it. You just have to do it once, document it, and hand it off. So that way it's not time-consuming for you anymore. That's amazing. Thank you. And I'm looking at the time, and I see that we are at time. I just wanted to take my time to thank you, Kalen, for your time and for everyone who joined us today live on the live streams and our socials and here on Zoom. Uh, we appreciate you. Also, if you are watching from LinkedIn or you're watching from Facebook or YouTube, if you want to watch the recording, you have to sign up on Digital Boost. You won't, well, I guess you can just watch the, the replay <laughs> on the socials. But to get recordings like this and many, many more, sign up on our Digital Boost website. You'll see that we've got tons and tons, as Caitlin had mentioned, all this free, what did we call it? The free private? Yep. Yes, that, free that, private material. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. please make sure you do that. Kaylin, thank you so much for joining us. Kaylin is going to be joining us again. I don't have the date available, but we are going to be doing a workshop 
please keep an eye out for that. You can go on our platform and sign up for it, RSVP for it. And, and we're going to, we're going to mine you for more information. That's what we're going to do. We're going to just keep digging away. Um, thank you, Kaylin. It was really helpful and extremely well presented. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, Ruth. Thank you everyone for coming. And we will, you know, I'm around. If you need anything, you can ask me, you know how to get in touch with Kaylin. Uh, Kaylin, did you get everyone? Everyone's given, you've given them a way to contact you through that link, which I will also post on our socials. Um, yeah. And we will see you all again soon. Appreciate all of your time. Thanks, everyone. Have fun out there.